This week, it's a summer sizzler with wheels, slides, and a very scary chicken. <laughs> The sun is shining, the temperature's soaring, and the robo mows are mowing. The science says we're going to have more and more of this weather in the future, and fortunately, the UK heatwave is less punishing than in much of the rest of the world. So we've done the typically British thing of dressing inappropriately and letting our robots get on with the work. They do know this is AstroTurf, don't they? Yeah, I'm afraid the heat has finally got to us, so this week we're cracking open the summer gadgets and the legs. Sorry about those. First thing we need to do is fire up the Barbie and forget coal, forget gas. This is the Go Sun Go. It is a solar-powered cooker. It has a parabolic mirror here which focuses the sun's rays onto this central tube where the temperature can get as high as 280 degrees Celsius. Now, it's got a stopper here so you can fill it with water if you fancy tea on the go. We have loaded it with lunch, so we'll see how that's doing a bit later. And while we wait to see whether the steak browns before I do, Stephen Beckett has been cooling off the only way that he knows how. Welcome to Terme Erding. Nestled in Germany's Bavarian countryside, this is one of the largest thermal baths in Europe. The perfect place to relax, have a drink, and maybe even do a little pool yoga. Oh, did I mention? There's also 27 water slides. There's a water slide. There's another one. That's a water slide too. Yes, this is also Europe's biggest water slide park. But with four and a half thousand people visiting here every day, is 27 slides enough? What if you could change the slides with the flick of a switch? It's time to get my swimming trunks on for some serious journalism. To go on one of the newest rides in the park, I'll need more than my togs and a tube though. I'll need one of these. amazing. I was, I was a bit sceptical. I think I need a little bit of practice. I was going backwards, I was going forwards. I didn't feel totally in control. I mean, essentially I went down that slide with my eyes shut. I I'm no slide connoisseur, but that was a pretty good slide. And because it's a VR slide, how about sliding through the snowy mountains, outer space, or this alien planet? That's four virtual slides, all packed into the twists and turns of one real slide. Sometimes people, especially all ones, say, I like it more without glasses because it's, they're overloaded with the, with the system. But the young people, the kids and the young people and families we have here, about 10 to 29, they like it and they love it. And they said it's the best thing they ever did in their life. And so now we had about more than 50,000 visitors use the VR. Normal land-loving VR headsets have already got a bit of a rep for being complicated to use. So getting the aquatic version to work well every day was a big challenge. Yes, it was very difficult. The first thing, we have to convince the owner that we want to do it. And, and we made the first tries and then Mr. Wundt, the owner of the Thermeering, tried it. And after two uh, tries, he was sick. And he said, no, I don't like this. I don't want. Because the difficulty is if you go on the slide on the left side and in the virtual reality, you go on the right side, you get this motion sickness. And to see how they solve that problem, first we'll need to get rid of some of this water. All along this slide are these sensors, and that's so that the virtual reality headset knows exactly where you are at exactly the right time. Because you want what you're seeing to be exactly the same as what you're feeling. Get it wrong and you could end up feeling a little bit sick. 
Stephen Greenwood and his team spent months building and crucially testing the system. We did hundreds of tests going down this slide. Each one of us has ridden the slide hundreds of times uh, because we had to make sure that we got it right. Just off for a dip. Stephen's next plan is to take the VR off the slides and into the wild. So this is a diving mask version of the same thing that I tried earlier. There's a, there's a phone in there, so you've, you've got a virtual reality headset. You can also dive. And the idea with this is that people who need to practice diving, like all rig repairers and uh, even astronauts, can train in one of these. But I'm just going to go on a shipwreck. When you combine that sensory feeling of being in a different environment with a completely virtual world over your eyes, it's a really powerful combination. I think there's huge potential for military and uh, marine technician training. These prototypes still need some work. For me, the image wasn't perfect. And more importantly, the waterproof phone that's hidden inside only knows where you're looking, not where you're moving. Solving that problem is the next big challenge. And in terms of the slide, well, they've got plans for that too. Uh, we're considering adding more features like sound and other sensory elements. I think that there's a big therapeutic factor. I think that there's a lot that we can do with physical therapy, meditation, uh, rehabilitation, um, and, and some of the psychological benefits that you can have from just floating in water and, and having a relaxing experience in front of your eyes. Sounds like this could just be the start of aquatic VR. Until then, though, I think the best I can do is just help out with the testing. Wow, Steve, that seemed like a really tough assignment. It well was done. hard. I won't lie, it was difficult. Well done I did it for, for you guys. It. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you've done a lot of work with VR over the last two or three years, and it seems at the moment we're talking more about VR coming to these theme park areas than mm. to the living room. I think the thing is that headsets still are quite expensive. They're getting a bit cheaper, but they're still quite expensive, and they're still quite difficult to use. So in a theme park environment, it's, it can be controlled, it can be managed, and um, of course, there's the thing that not everyone has a roller coaster or a water slide in their home. <laughs> so <laughs> That's true, yeah. Um, and it does seem that um, that adds to the experience, doesn't it? I mean, that adds to the senses, because VR doesn't, doesn't do that at the moment. Well, this is it. The promise of VR that we see in films, in sci-fi films and all that sort of thing, is that VR will totally immerse us, it will fool every single sense of our body, but at the moment VR only fools two senses, our eyes and our ears, and it doesn't really do that particularly well. So maybe this is a way, this is the first step to fooling our other senses, our sense of motion, our sense of touch. Did you enjoy it? Stupid question. I did enjoy it. I, was, I had reservations about going, essentially going down the slide with my eyes closed. Um, <laughs> but once you get over that, it's, quite, it's, it's fun. It's good. Well, well done. Take a long and well-deserved well, break thank after you. that arduous. It's been hard. Shoot. Right, we've been in the water. Time to go for a bike ride now. And uh, gone are the days when you could just slap on a cycling helmet and pootle around the roads and the cycle paths. These days, you have to load up with the latest cycling tech. It's the law. And that's what Lara Lewington has been doing with the help of Click's own boss, Simon. Meet Simon, a regular cyclist and the editor of Click. First up is the Coros Smart Cycle Helmet. It connects to your mobile phone via Bluetooth and thanks to bone conduction technology, you can hear any sound that you want from your phones. So that could be directions or music without blocking out the sound of the road around you. Be safe. Thank you. It can be controlled via a remote or its app, which allows you to save routes and share data with friends. It also has a wind-resistant microphone designed for calls. If you consider chatting on the phone while cycling is a good idea, that is. Well, we had a nice chat on the phone there. The <coughs> sound was amazing. It was so clear. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely the best thing I've tried on a, on a bike like that, uh, just in terms of the quality of the, uh, the call. With this, you've got the added dimension of making sure that the bone conduction things are in exactly the right place. Yeah, and it's quite feeling. I mean, getting jawbone right is always a, a, a it's always a, a difficult one. Um, and with this, really, after a couple of weeks of trying to perfect it to get the perfect signal, you kind of have to get it so tight you're almost garroting yourself. I notice that when you're when I'm in the middle of London and there's loads of traffic, it's still kind of difficult to hear, I suppose. But I guess some people would say, well, it's probably a lot better to be able to hear the traffic than it is the music anyway. 
This is Air Pure, an anti-pollution mask for cyclists and motorcyclists. The replaceable filters claim to keep pollution, pollen, viruses and bacteria at bay. And based on where you've been cycling, the app will access pollution data and figure out when you need to replace the filter. You look slightly menacing in that. It's also 30 degrees in London today. Was it yeah, hot in there? It's pretty hot, actually, yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's better than some I've tried, I have to say, in that regard. This is a lot more comfortable than some I've tried before, and I think it looks slightly nicer, nicer design, perhaps. That said, it's very expensive compared to other masks. How about the idea that it connects to an app and aims to track the pollution that you're going to be encountering? Yeah, I mean, to me, that sounds like a, a classic bit of tech over-design, really. I think you can use common sense a little bit to, to know when to change filters. Finally, we have blinkers, which are claimed to be the next generation of bike lights. They can shine a laser light in the street and they also provide the normal functions you'd expect from a light. But the question is, are they any better? They're all yours to give a go. So the conclusion? You've got the, the brake light, which lights up as you slow down, presumably because it's got an accelerometer. It's really impressive. And you know, when, you work, when you're a cyclist, you do worry about people not noticing that you're coming to a, coming to a halt. Left and right indicators. There's so few cyclists who use uh, that as a method of indication. I've, I don't think I've ever seen any, to be honest. And actually, in the instruction manual, it says, don't rely on this on its own. You've also got to use your arm. I'd worry that I just have too much stuff to think about almost. So, so that would that would concern me. Um, they are very very bright lights, and we've we see there's almost an arms race in cycle lights these days. They get brighter and brighter and brighter, and, and these are very impressive even in daylight. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that Google released its latest operating system, the Android Pie. Indian ride-hailing app Ola unveiled plans to move to the UK by the end of 2018. And it looks like Master Chief will be getting his own TV show. Showtime announced a Halo live action series will go into production next year. It was also the week that Alex Jones and Infowars were deleted from several places on the internet. Companies like Facebook, YouTube and Apple removed the conspiracy theorists from their platforms for using hate speech. Twitter, however, didn't follow suit, stating that he hadn't violated its rules. Facebook debuted their AR Messenger games this week, which allow users to play games in group chat. It does, however, seem to bear a striking resemblance to Snapchat's Snappables, which launched earlier this year. Harvard researchers have developed small, squishy spider robots called microfluidic origami for reconfigurable pneumatic hydraulic devices, or MORPH for short. The eight-legged bot's body is made entirely from silicone, and fluids are pumped into its legs to make it move. The team hope these kind of microbots could be used for delicate surgery in the future. And finally, researchers have taught an AI how to dribble. No, not like a baby a basketball. The team from Carnegie Mellon University and Deep Motion Incorporated used motion capture and deep reinforcement learning to improve the skills of their virtual player. Slam dunk. No summer party is complete without a warm bottle of red wine. Now, did you know that if you open a bottle of wine and you don't finish it within a week, which apparently is possible, the air that gets into the wine starts to turn it. It doesn't taste as good. Instead, you might like to use the Coravin wine pourer, which you clamp to the bottle. This only works if it's got a cork, not a screw top on the top. Right, so what you do is clamp it there and then drive a thin needle through the cork and into the bottle. When it's time to pour, this thing pumps argon gas into the wine bottle instead of air. That lets the liquid out, but then there's no air in the bottle to make the wine go bad. Then, when you take it off, rather violently, there's pretty much no hole in the cork, so the wine doesn't come out. What a corker, cheers. I tell you, the views from the top of John Lewis here in Oxford Street are pretty spectacular, but they are nothing compared to what we have next for you. 
one daredevil is taking Grand Vistas to an entirely new height. Literally. And Nick Quick went to Marseille to meet him. That's right, Spen. I've popped down to Provence to poke about a Frenchman's garage. We are um, in our office, our workshop. Yeah. It's where we do all research and development. A former jet ski world champion, Frankie Zapata has been at the forefront of water-powered vehicles for decades. He's been beavering away over the years on several airborne inventions. I started with the, this prototype yeah. Yeah. in 2011. Okay. Then we, we built the real one. Two years after, I get the idea of the hoverboard. And then we get the idea to create uh, the fly ride. So this product is self-balancing. Oh, right. Okay, you, wow. you use servo, you have just to press the trigger, and you fly. But recently, he's developed a penchant for rocket fuel. <laughs> This bad boy has five jet engines packed tightly together to blast Frankie off into the stratosphere. Well, maybe not that high, but it can reach a top speed of 110 miles per hour. You have a plan B for everything. You have plan A, plan B, and plan C for the electronics, and you have plan A and plan B for the stabilization, and you, have, and you, have, and you can lose an engine. So if one of these five engines blows, then? It's still flying. So you can lose two engines and still flying. The explosion will be contained by, uh, by some uh, Kevlar protection. The and explosion? If, if it explodes. It can hold someone weighing up to 100 kilos at 500 feet for six minutes. At 250k a pop, surely Frank's quids in then. It's not something that we, we plan to sell. Why not? If I tried this today, what would happen? With this one? Yeah. Today, you will kill yourself. Right. A wired handheld joystick lets Frankie control his yaw and thrust, but it's his body that supplies the real computational power. To stay on the board for, for more than, than one to two minutes, you, you have to be able to absorb about two G-force with, no no with 25 kilos in the back. <laughs> and you need about like a thousand hours on the air product. The balance is the same as the water fly board, but just 20 times more. How hard can it be? I am not straight about like five days a week, do some kind of Cross training, or and just to be able to to re resist on, on the stress you have in your leg. As well as a flyboard air, Frankie's also developed the Easy Board, a version with sticks currently being trialled by the U.S. military. We did some tests with the U.S. military. That was the the first soldier we trained. So that's the machine we're going to sell. The flyboard air is more like a demonstrator. The this is your baby. The that's my baby. You know, it's like it's my Iron Man suit. You know, yeah. Tony Stark don't sell it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I can hear the jets. I can hear the jets firing up now. Frankie's ready for takeoff. He's off! He's off! Yeah, He's off! Look at him go! That's amazing! See you later. I'm off on the hoverboard. And how does it feel when you're up there flying this around? Wow, it's just out of this world. It's the it's the best things I ever did in my life. To be able to do this, you do have to be ultra specialist and physically brilliant. So for me, that means sitting back, plonked happily on terra firma, enjoying the beautiful Marseille coastline, with a man flying around my head. I'm gonna get a selfie. Right, time to see how lunch is doing, and I'm going to test the temperature of our steak using a meat thermometer. Not any old meat thermometer, of course, this is the meter, which of course talks to my smartphone. Via the app, you can tell it what you're cooking, what your desired temperature is, and then it 
will monitor the temperature for you and alert you when you are medium, well done, or raring to go. And not long later, the steak is really very well done indeed. Hope you like the nail varnish I had time to apply while waiting. <clears throat> and now, from steak to chicken. Yes, go with me on this, because Dave Lee has been touring Silicon Valley to look at how some tech professionals are choosing to unwind. Across California, there are as many as 60,000 chicken coops. A lot of them are here in Silicon Valley. Many are owned by techies because having chickens has become something of a status symbol. Down there's one, and then they have one as well. We'll hear more from him later. As for now, I've just arrived at my first stop. Heather's role at her job is to help top tech executives communicate with each other. When she comes home, she communicates with her chickens. Hey girls, come here. It's like digital detox. It's about as far from tech. It kind of takes you back to the farmland. My parents, my dad grew up on a dairy farm. So this is a nice reminder of when I was a kid going back to the farm. This coop is a place of real luxury, a property in keeping with the mega homes that surround it. We built a um, irrigation system that connects to the sprinklers, so it, we never have to fill up water, so that's always wow, done. so it kind of looks after itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just we fill up the feeding tubes in the back about once every 10 days. And, um, and then it's just, um, just scooping poop and holding the chickens. They love to be held. Isn't she lovely? Heather's children are, of course, fully paid up members of the smartphone generation, but they have a lot of time for their foul friends. It's oh. about the only thing that gets them outside. Hello. Johan, how's it going? Good, thanks. I've come you? to see your chickens. Yeah, please. Johan's day job has him working on the very cutting edge of self-driving car technology. But when he gets home, he likes to get his hands dirty. So these are the wow. chickens? When you're working and not looking after the animals, what's, what's a typical day? Long days, it's intense days, it's a lot of pressure. We want to do a lot and uh, we have ambitious plans and it requires hard work to, to achieve those. Johan shares his home with a wife, four children, five sheep and 13 chickens. You're living in a part of the world where the latest technology is readily available and people are worried about how yeah. looped into that we are. Yeah. So how important is it to make sure that the kids get a sense of the real world? Um, no, it's, it's very important, right? Like, because it's easy for, the, for them to just get caught up in this, in this area where there's a lot of pressure on school and, and, and whatnot. Looking after the chickens and selling eggs to the neighbors, at least the ones who don't have their own chickens, is all about considering the value of removing tech from these kids' lives, if only for a small part of each day. Now I can see the appeal to looking after chickens, getting back to nature, realising what's important. And for people in the tech business, it seems to really help. For people in the journalism business, not so much. <laughs> I'm going to put him down. He's going to peck me like crazy. Go away. Ah! <laughs> that was Dave Lee recuperating Coop, do you see, in Silicon Valley. Honestly, I've never seen anyone as scared of a chicken as he was. And that's it for our summer sizzler. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And don't forget, we live on Facebook and on Twitter too, at BBC Click. Now, after such an intense summer of sport, next week, we're gonna look back at some of the new tech that's been brought into play in the last few months. And we will leave you with one more thing, which we hope illustrates the perils of filming someone going down a VR water slide. Enjoy this. Our cameraman Nick Quack certainly did. <laughs>